Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. So glad you're here with us this morning as we launch this new series. Would you stand with us? We're going to start off in Romans 15 here this morning. It says, May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. As different as we all are, we are united in one single truth in Jesus Christ, that we are redeemed sinners, and so we come with one voice to worship. So let's do that this morning. To the King of glory and light, all praises. To the only giver of life, our maker. The gates are open wide, we worship you. Come see what love has done, amazing. He bought us with his blood, our Savior. The cross is overcome, we worship you. the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise treasures of fate are never enough you came along 
put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing Nothing is better than you oh, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness My failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, oh, there's nothing better than you. strength is redemption. Why don't you have a seat here for a minute? Love that song. Glad you're here this morning. Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. As uh, most of you by now know, if not all, uh, at the beginning of the year, um, 
our friend Eric, he'll always be Pastor Eric, I guess, um, accepted a position to be uh, the new director, president, CEO, dictator <laughs> of the Up Global Network, created and uh, started by another friend of ours, Pastor Rex. And uh, we felt like it was the right thing, the proper thing, to uh, express in a more formal way our thanks and appreciation to Eric for just, just months shy of 10 years as pastor here. So we want to start that with just a quick message, Eric and Abby, from uh, those of us who have worked side by side with you every day for the last 10 years. Go ahead. Eric, I want to thank you for 10 years of friendship. That won't end, um, thankfully. I also want to just thank you for 10 years of dedicated ministry here at FBC, and I don't use that term just lightly. Um, you served with passion and purpose, and I know you were prayerful. Sorry for the alliteration. Everything you set your heart to and your mind to, you went at it, you went at it with a whole heart. And it, it shows we are a healthier, stronger church because of your work. Abby, I thank you for the sacrifices you made. I don't think a lot of people know what it's like to be in your position. I can't say I do completely, but uh, I know our wives rejoice with us, suffer with us, and sacrifice with us. Um, it felt strange not having you around last uh, Monday during staff meeting and prayer time. We, we already miss you, um, but your presence is, uh, is felt. And I, I want you to know the long-term effects of, uh, of what you've done for FBC, what you've done for your God, um, and his glory here at this place. So thanks, Eric, and uh, looking forward to working alongside you in a different capacity, a different role with Up Global, but looking for years more of, uh, of ministry with you. Love you. Eric Fry Guy, hey, what a um, blessing and privilege it is to be, um, be your friend, to get to work with you. Um, I'm thankful for all the things that you brought to the table for FBC over the years. Um, and you're the one crazy enough to suggest me to be the campus pastor. And um, if it wasn't for you, I, I wouldn't have ended up here. So um, I owe a lot to you in that sense. And um, just think about our friendship and, and the gifting you have as a pastor, um, your faithfulness, um, you being steadfast to the church and to... Um, I just think you always were purposeful and intentional in the questions you asked and, and getting to know people and caring about people's souls. So I'm, I'm thankful for that, for our church and for the way that you blessed us over the years. Um, you're a good guy. Got to see that. Got to uh, obviously be close uh, going to Ethiopia and trips like that. And, and I just see that that being a um, up global being incredibly blessed to have you lead them. Uh, into the future of their organization and um, you know I think probably the most spiritual thing about you is that you like Mountain Dew um, <laughs> and that you can eat the spiciest hot wings at uh, Buffalo <laughs> Wild Wings so no I, I'm truly grateful for you and I know this church has been um, blessed in ways um, eternal ways and so um, thanks for all you did and uh, and we'll still see you around hopefully all right Hey, Eric and Abby, just wanted to say thank you for your tremendous investment, both in Jenna and my life, as well as the life of this church in general. You guys were instrumental in our transition here two and a half years ago. I remember staying in your basement for a weekend. Abby keeps that thing at 62 degrees, but we were able to stay and quickly discover how hard it is to find a house here in Gardner. Uh, and we came up fruitless and had to go home, and you guys 
went and visited our first choice for rental and kindly told us that it was trash and we needed to move on. Uh, and you guys actually found us our first rental here. So uh, you guys were paramount in getting us here smoothly. Uh, Eric, you taught me the ropes. You showed me all the technical aspects of how ministry works here, but you also taught me who this church is, its culture. And, uh, and that just helped me understand how to love and serve this church family better, as well as just make this our church family quickly. Uh, you were always there. Uh, if I needed to have help figuring something out, if I needed to vent about something, you were more than willing to help every time I thought I was in over my head. So thank you for that. I, I know this isn't goodbye, but this is day three of you being out of the office and it just feels different. It feels a little bit more empty. And how dare you leave me with Ty and Damon? <laughs> I still got Madison Stacy, so that's pretty cool. Um, so you are missed. Even though this isn't goodbye, you are missed. Um, both of you guys' passion for Christ's truth and his mission and serving those that are hurting has propelled this church forward uh, to be the people that God has called us to be. And, and we certainly would not be the same without you. Uh, again, I'm excited that you guys aren't actually leaving and you're still part of the family. So I am excited to see how God continues to use us, use you here, but also how he intends to use you guys in this new season. So thank you for your investment here. And I can't wait to see how God uses you. Eric Fry, my action leader, my brother, my friend. The last 10 years have been an incredible journey alongside you. Uh, man, I've been so privileged to have known you and in a context more, uh, greater than many here at FBC have been able to know you from half Ironman to mission trips, retreats, seminars, conferences, weekly lunches, weekly meetings, family vacations. Uh, you've been a huge part of my life these last 10 years. And I am truly blessed because of that relationship uh, with you, with your family. I'm so excited to see how God works in your life, how God leads you through these uh, next 10 years as you transition roles through Up Global Mission. Uh, I'll be praying with you, praying for you, praying alongside you as you make this transition. Uh, it's it's sad, but it's, it's also exciting to see you respond to the Lord, to see you uh, follow him wholeheartedly. And as I've seen your heart these last 10 years, I know that that heart will continue uh, to grow for the sake of Christ and the work of the gospel ministry that he has laid before you. So Eric, I simply say thank you. Thank you for all you've done for me, for the blessing that you've been to me, to my family. I love you. Come on up, Eric and Abby, if you would, please. Hard to, we were given a two minute time frame, so it was, that, was, that was challenging. And I think the longest was Zach's, but who's counting? Um, okay, so we said a lot of things. I don't need to repeat. Uh, the, the people in the church have said a lot of things they want to share with you guys. And I can't give these to you because i got to do this second service. But I will give them to you at second service. The church wants to say thank you. And I can't give this to you until second service. Um, but it's... Uh, you know, those words are just, when, when you mean thank you, they are so deep that you can't even put expression to it. But that's how we feel. We just, we thank you for your obedience and your faithfulness, your persistence, your care and your compassion for this place, for us. Um, so with much gratitude and uh, yeah, we're just, we're grateful. 
And I, I told you that I was going to give you a mic, and uh, you can say what you want to say. Abby can say what she wants to say. So I'm going to turn it over to you. I, I will actually say something. Um, so just listening to that kind of, I was like, oh, it kind of reminded me at um, a funeral when you're hearing someone's like, <laughs> eulogy. <laughs> but I was like, how cool that we get to he actually hear that, right? Because I think that a lot of times people hear words or they don't get to hear the words that people say about them. So really appreciate that. And we have, yeah, loved being here. Um, so yeah. I'm the more emotional of the two. <laughs> so I actually handed her that because I needed to kind of catch myself here for a second. But we've had the opportunity a couple of times in between when we announced uh, the, the direction that we were going to be heading at the beginning of the year to, to just briefly express our gratitude. Um, but I can remember vividly being here April 2011 right after this part of the church had been opened up <coughs> and coming to candidate after having waited for about a little over a year to figure out where God was going to place us in ministry. Having to, I've told this story many times, but having to drive about 30 minutes from the home that we were living in to just even send out resumes at a Dunkin' Donuts parking lot to churches, and then one day while I was helping out a, a, a friend in, in Abby's home church replace some subfloor in his house, I get a call from Ty Cross, and we just start this dialogue, and if you've seen God work in this way where you've, he's opened up something to you, and you've trusted him in it, there's few, just one second. There's few things that are more beautiful and faith building than that. So that's a part of our story. And this place is a part of our story and it will continue to be. We just say thank you uh, so much for investing in us, for allowing us to be able to say words that, to build you guys up. And honestly, that's not going to stop. Just because I'm not on staff here doesn't mean I'm not going to continue speaking into your lives. So just, yeah, the, the, the most important thing I can say is thank you. And uh, we're just going to continue pursuing God together. So appreciate it, church. When you said that, Abby, I have seen you cry. And it was the Sunday that Eric led as the candidate. I don't, remember the th I don't remember what my sermon was, but I remember saying we need to end this message with a song about... <laughs> and it's, at the time, all of a sudden, I thought, oh, this is the most manipulative thing I've ever done. Because the song was about where you go, I'll go, and all that stuff, and will I be faithful? And she's sitting there just like, I can't say, we can't say no. <laughs> um, she, saw it. she saw the sign join with me would you stand up and would you join me uh, in praying with and for Eric and Abby Father um, thank you for the gift that you have given this church and Eric and Abby and Libby and Jackson and Hayden um, and thank you that you're not taking that gift away <laughs> Uh, though the uh, relationship changes slightly. God, um, would this, I just pray that this would be a lesson uh, for all of us, just the, the impact of, of speaking into people's lives, the impact of fellowship and community that it can have in all of our lives, how empty our lives would be without community and how empty our community would be without Christ and so for his sake and for his glory we give you thanks and praise for the work and the ministry that Eric and Abby have poured into this place and will continue to 
Um, but in a special way, we pray that you would bless Eric and Abby as they embark in this new uh, venture, a, a new path in their journey with Up Global, connecting churches to unreached peoples around the world. Uh, what a great calling. So bless them, Father. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just continue with the song of just a song of praise and of thanks um, for God's <laughs> leading in this season. I'm going to need your guys' help. <laughs> I've shed more than a few tears this week, um, but we are thankful to God most of all that He brought the fries here. That uh, they have done the tremendous work they have done. So let's sing. the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His soul. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. The sun comes up. 
God, we just want to praise you for your provision. Praise you for your sovereignty and working all things for your glory and our good. We thank you for where you've brought us as a church here, and we look forward to how you will bring us in your sovereignty and your goodness and your care to your future. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a seat. So um, when you think you've seen it all, a week like this past week emerges in our country, and it's one of the few times I honestly wondered about changing the entire direction of the sermon, and then With a lot of thought and prayer and thinking while praying, I, I just remember this thought coming into my head that the best way to um, to respond to difficult moments, potentially divisive moments, is to just keep preaching the word and to just continue presenting God to us, that we would know him on a deeper level. And as we know him more deeply, understand him more clearly, that it would change us. And it, its effect would be unity and faith and hope and love. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to continue digging deep into the character and the conduct of a loving, merciful God. So with that, we start this morning an 11-week series. I'm you guys, if you have an idea, you're one of me. If you don't, you're not. I'm as excited when we start a new sermon series on the book of the Bible as like a, the start of a vacation. There's, that, there's some eager anticipation. There's joy. There's, there's, there's excitement. And you're like, wow, uh, I've heard you preach. You shouldn't get that excited. Um, <laughs> But I can honestly say that as well, my earnest prayer is that what may, whatever may prevent you at this moment from being just as excited about studying the book of the Bible, that God would take that away, that God would overcome that, and that he would, he would press into you so that on the other side, you would look and say, wow, I, that was amazing. You are amazing, God. Because I'm convinced that we have come to the study of the book of Esther, this part of God's story, for such a time as this. And if you know the book of Esther, you recognize that line from chapter 4. And in preparation um, this week, I found myself reflecting on the words from the 42nd Psalm and how, again, how timely and accurate they are. That what the psalmist said there reflects my heart, and I'm convinced reflects yours. That our souls are panting for God like a deer pants for water. That our souls thirst for God. And that even our tears have been our food while we ask, where are you, God? 
The story of Esther is the story of a time where God seemed very much absent. Highlighted by the fact that we mentioned this a few weeks ago, God's name does not appear anywhere in the book. So for that reason and others that we'll see as we go through this study, Esther has been at times throughout the history of the church an overlooked, misunderstood, and even rejected book. We don't have record of any commentary on the book of Esther among the Christian church for the first seven centuries. Not a one. If it exists, we haven't found it. John Calvin did not write a commentary on the book of Esther, though he wrote it on most every other book. And as far as we know, he never preached a sermon from the book of Esther. Martin Luther rejected the book altogether. It was too earthy for him. But he rejected James. He, he was into rejecting books. I don't, there's a special place in heaven for Martin Luther. Um, and so the, even though the name of God isn't mentioned, I think it won't come as any surprise when I say his fingerprint is all over the story. So it seems in this case that the early Christians kind of missed the forest for the trees. Because on, on the tree, on the individual tree level, Esther is messy and at times confusing. Again, no mention of God, no mention of Jerusalem, no mention of prayer, no mention of the law, completely void in the story in Esther. And what we do have is suggestively, at times, immoral and unlawful. But at the forest level, we see this amazing landscape of how God works in all of that behind what is seen. And so we have before us, and I, I pray that you will be prepared each week, we have before us the living word of the living God. In all that seems confusing and hard to digest, digest, the story of Esther is in our Bibles because God wanted the story of Esther to be in our Bibles. And so what Paul wrote in Romans 15, 4 applies and is just as true of Esther as it is of Genesis. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of Scripture, we might have hope. So we're on an 11-week venture through the book of Esther, and on the other side of it is the potential of greater hope, more certain hope than where we, are, where we are today. So for that reason, why don't we pray and ask God to bless what we're about to embark on. Father, open not just our Bibles before us, but our hearts and our minds before your revealed word. That we would, in fact, receive instruction and through endurance, through the encouragement that we receive from Scripture, we might know and experience and share hope. In Christ we pray. Amen. So as I'm prone to do before a book study, I want to offer an overview that I hope helps us know what it is we're looking for and looking at. I'm, I've, I don't remember the first time I heard this analogy, but it has always stuck with me that too often... People in our churches, when we, when we just burst open the Bible and, and start preaching or reading or teaching a, a, a passage of Scripture, for a lot of people, it's like walking into the middle of a movie, and they're a little bit uncertain as to what's going on around it. So I, I want to make sure that we're not there. So let me say, first of all, <clears throat> if you have not read the book of Esther, please, please, please do so this week. It is, it is just, it's one story. It's, it's, it's not like Genesis that, you know, here's, here, okay, this is a section about Noah and the ark. And then that, now we got, now here's Abraham's story. And so it is one story, 10 chapters, and the 10th chapter is only three verses. So really nine chapters. Read the story of Esther this week. 
That's my encouragement. It is a great story. It is one of the greatest stories you'll ever read. It is full of intrigue. It is full of fascinating characters, plot twists, and and surprising reversals. You will have to remind yourself that it's a true story as you read it. Now, there's a challenge then in preaching a story, and that is that we're going to have to break it up. And, and, And it really doesn't deserve to be broken up. It deserves to be read in its entirety, which you're going to do this week. But we're going to have to preach it in bits and pieces, okay? And that, that presents a little bit of a challenge. So let me just offer this summation so you have a, an, an idea of what you're getting into. The main premise of the book is to explain the Jewish feast called Purim, a feast and a festival still held among Jews to this day. The next occurrence of Purim is a month away from sundown February 25th to sundown February 26th. So it's coming up. Purim is taken from the root word of pur, P-U-R, which we'll see in the story is like, it's like a dice or a, a lot that is cast. And we'll see in the story the particulars about what the pur was cast for. I just entered the sentence in a preposition, but you get the idea. Um, The purr was cast to see what day on the calendar the Jews were going to be annihilated. Wiped out. So, spoiler alert, it doesn't happen. (laughs) I think you kind of gathered that. God prevented the Jewish people from annihilation which is a pretty good reason to hold a celebration. The story's hero, Esther, becomes queen, and in time, she will risk her life to save the Jews. Esther's success in reversing this plot is celebrated then in the Feast of Purim. So it it sounds like a story of biblical proportion, and it is. But like I said, if you focus on the trees, if you focus just on the, the minute details, it gets messy. And we will spend some time in the details. It's, it's a simple story, but when you start to tell, it's like one of those stories you tell someone and they, they start asking questions and you say, it's complicated. <laughs> it's kind of like that. It, it's simple, but it's complicated. So as an overview, I want us to notice throughout this series, these three lessons that we're going to talk about this morning, you're going to see it all throughout the 10 chapters of Esther, along with two critical theological truths that I want to touch on this morning as well. So three lessons that you're going to see throughout the book of Esther. For that matter, you'll see these throughout large portions of scripture. Lesson number one, God works his perfect plan through imperfect people. Now, that's just true (laughs) from beginning to end, isn't it? If you've read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, you understand this. It's true in the New Testament as well. God works a perfect plan through imperfect people. So who are these imperfect people? Again, here's here's the cast of main characters. Again, as I mentioned, there's Esther, a young Jewish girl living with other exiles, of, other Jewish exiles in, in Persia, specifically in the city of Susa. She was orphaned and she was raised by her cousin, who's really a father figure. His name is Mordecai. There's the king of Persia. His name is Xerxes. I'm going to, and by the way, I'm, I'm doing something I, I, I told myself I wouldn't, we're going to, I'm going to use the NIV throughout this series because it just reads better. If there are it's, it's perfectly legitimate translation. It, it sometimes misses nuances of specific words that the English Standard Version does, but it's, it's an easier read throughout the entire story. And in the NIV, the king is called by his Greek name, Xerxes. In the ESV, they use his, his Hebrew name, Ahasuerus, but we're going to use Xerxes. Xerxes' queen, albeit temporarily in the story, is a woman named Vashti. And then the other main character is Xerxes' right-hand man, a fellow by the name of Haman. 
Now, like other characters from Scripture, Esther and Mordecai at times exhibit great courage and great conviction, but it also at other times show deep flaws. In other words, they're a lot like us. <laughs> now, some background. The events of Esther take place approximately 50 years after the book of Daniel, after his life. So we looked at Daniel, I think, last year in, in two, well, two year, in 2019, we went through the book of Daniel. This is taking place sometime around 50 to 60 years after that. So the people of Israel, remember, have been exiled into Babylon for their ongoing disobedience. Babylon, at time, in time, was overtaken by the Persians. Daniel lived through this transition. Under the first Persian king, Cyrus, Jews were allowed to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. That's what you read in your Bibles in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. So this is all taking place. The Jews exiled under Babylon. Babylon loses to the Persians. The first Persian king says, if you want to go back, feel free to go back. He had ulterior motives for that. But that was, they were allowed to do so. However, many Jews remained in Persia, which in and of itself just kind of starts to raise a bit of a flag. If you read Ezra and you read Nehemiah especially, you hear the passion for returning to Jerusalem and rebuilding the wall and the temple to the point of, of, of so many times, so many different people just shedding tears and wailing for the city. And yet, many Jews chose to remain in Persia. That's a bit of a red flag. They settled for the safety of Persia rather than return to uncertain conditions in, in Jerusalem. One commentator put it this way. Many had forgotten their calling to separateness and had chosen to compromise their heritage for the sake of personal ease and advancement. Now, in the case of Mordecai and Esther, they settled in the stronghold city, as we mentioned earlier, of Susa. We've seen that city before. Daniel chapter 8, Daniel was in Susa when he received a vision. And again, here's another red flag. It's interesting to know that Esther, we know Esther by her Persian name, and not her Hebrew name. Her Hebrew name is Hadassah. It's just the opposite with Daniel, right? Daniel was given a Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, but we call him by his Hebrew name. The, the author is, it's, it's almost like the author is saying, he didn't assimilate into that culture. And it's maybe a bit of a suggestion by the author that Esther has assimilated into the culture. And that's how we know her, by her Persian name. But God will work his perfect plan through imperfect people. We've noted a couple of those imperfections. They continue as we read the story. We'll look next week at a little marital spat between Xerxes and Vashti, which leads her to being banished as the queen. And a decision is made to hold a kingdom-wide search for the new Mrs. Xerxes. Mordecai decides to enter Esther into the search, which means she will become part of the king's harem for over a year, preparing for her opportunity to go before the king and impress him above all the other women in the harem, all the while concealing her identity as a Jew. Flag. <laughs> Again, this is a bit of an imperfection. She doesn't seem to have any convictions about eating the king's food like Daniel did. She certainly sees nothing wrong with marrying a pagan king. And the means by which she wins the king's favor are highly questionable at best. And behind it all is Mordecai who got her into the harem in the first place. So for these reasons and more, scholars, for the early, especially the early centuries, wrestled with the earthiness of the book of Esther. Now, Two sub points here, real quickly. Don't reach two extreme conclusions here. One extreme conclusion is to say, well, then it doesn't really matter how I live because God's going to do what God's going to do. That's, that's, that's akin to 
what Paul wrote after explaining salvation by grace through faith, reaching Romans chapter 6, verse 1, and almost hearing people say, well, then I should just go on sinning so that God's grace may abound. And Paul said, are you out of your mind? Absolutely not. The sovereignty of God is never, ever our excuse for selfish living. The call on the people of God is always to be holy as he is holy, separate. So don't reach that first extreme conclusion that it doesn't matter how we live. Second extreme conclusion, though, is to say that God can only use us if our character is flawless and we have all of our moral ducks in a row. Well, that's an equally erroneous conclusion. If that were the case, then Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Samson, David, Peter, Paul, every character in the Old Testament is useless. We're all flawed. So we don't glory in shortcomings, but we can give glory to God who works perfectly despite our shortcomings. We'll see this clearly in the book of Esther. Second lesson, God wields his control in difficult conditions. So just as God doesn't need perfect people to work his perfect plan, neither does he require ideal or perfect conditions to achieve his desired result. In fact, he works in conditions at times so difficult that the people of God are prone to ask, where are you, God? And that's when he shows up and does some of his very best work. In the story of Esther, we'll see that the king issues a decree for the complete annihilation of the Jews on a certain date on the calendar. That's where the purr was cast. And the reader thinks that they're out of the woods because when the one who talked the king into that decree is taken out of the picture, well, then you think, well, the king's edict can be revoked. And then we learn, no, it can't. It can't be revoked. I, I, and it's like there's this moment where where Xerxes is like, I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do. My hands are tied. This is a law of the Medes and the Persians now. Can't be revoked. What's going to happen? Just a couple of weeks ago during Advent, we heard the angel Gabriel tell Mary, nothing's impossible for God. And that's a, that's a truth. <laughs> Doesn't matter if it's with Esther or, or Mary or you or I. What we learn is that the king allows Mordecai and Esther to write another decree using his name that allows the Jews to assemble, protect themselves, and actually destroy those intent on destroying them. So now when the king issues a second decree and says it's in my name that the Jews can defend themselves, don't you imagine that there are fewer people going out to fight the Jews than previously because the king has said now they can defend themselves and they have my permission to do so. God wields his power his control in some of the most difficult conditions. Third lesson. And this is what we've been alluding to already a few times. God is omnipotently present, even where he is conspicuously absent. In this story, with as much at stake as there is, the annihilation of the Jews... God chooses not to come to Mordecai or Esther in a dream. There is no thus saith the Lord in the book of Esther. Why is that the case? Why is God's name not mentioned in the book? I land where Alistair Begg lands because he didn't want his name in the book. God chose to tell the story through his work and not his words. The great 19th century English preacher Charles Spurgeon, you've probably heard that name, maybe you've read a, a few sermons of his devotional books, had a great way of, of, of addressing this. He said in one of his sermons on the book of Esther, although the name of God does not appear in the book of Esther, the Lord himself is there conspicuously in every incident which it relates. And then he offers this analogy. I have seen portraits bearing the names of persons for whom they were intended, and they certainly needed them. In other words, back in the days before everyone had a camera in their pocket or purse, you, if you wanted to remember someone, you, took their, you painted their portrait. And he said, I've seen a great many of those portraits with names at the bottom, 
and they needed the name at the bottom because it didn't really look like Aunt Penelope, although that's Aunt Penelope. And so you put the portrait up in your home and it says Aunt Penelope because otherwise you wouldn't know. But then he says this, but we have all seen other portraits which require no name because they were such striking likenesses that the moment you looked upon them, you knew them. Read the story of Esther and you will recognize and you will see God on every page. Name doesn't have to be there. You recognize him. You recognize how that happened, when it happened, how it happened. He is omnipotently present from the beginning to the end, even if he seems conspicuously absent. Well, that leads us then to two points of theology this morning. Why Esther cannot be and should not be ignored. The first point we want to highlight, because we're going to see it throughout the next 10 weeks, is the providence of God. You're probably already ahead of me on this one. So if you gave the book of Esther, the story of Esther, to someone who knows nothing about Scripture, nothing about God, nothing about faith, nothing about Old Testament history or even the church, you just gave it to them to read, they would come back and say, wow, a lot of coincidence. It was fate. A lot of chance involved. How lucky. Too good to be true. That's what they would say. But life, as we know, is not a random collection of coincidences, is it? We are not the results of luck, good or bad. So again, read Esther this week and notice how many times the story takes a turn. And what's the explanation for that? You'll see and you'll recognize God. His portrait. His providence. Now, I've used that word a few times, actually a lot of times in, in uh, sermons. And I've offered a, at times a definition of providence by the theologian J.I. Packer. I'm going to go to a little different source this week and offer you this definition of providence. That God, in some invisible and inscrutable way, governs all creatures, actions, and circumstances through the normal and the ordinary course of human life without the intervention of the miraculous. Now, be careful. I'm not saying that God can't work miracles. It's just that when he does, we tend to recognize it. That's an act of God, we say. It's not always the case with providence. We don't always recognize it until after the fact, sometimes years, sometimes decades, centuries after the fact, do we recognize that God had been governing people's actions, circumstances through the whole thing in the normal course of life. Or if you just really have to have your J.I. Packer fix, he says, God is completely in charge of his world. His hand may be hidden, but his rule is absolute. It's the truth. It's how he works. Let me give you another example. <clears throat> Remember the book of Ruth, the only other Old Testament book named after a woman? Ruth and her husband left Bethlehem because there was famine and they went to live among the Moabites kind of really enemy territory. Their daughters or their sons marry Moabite women, but in the course of time, Naomi, her husband dies, her sons die. So it's Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. Naomi decides it's time to go back to Bethlehem. Only one of the daughters-in-law follows with her. Her name is Ruth. They get back to Bethlehem. And so here's this outsider, this Moabite woman named Ruth. And she and her Mother-in-law are kind of poor. They're destitute. What are they, how are they going to survive? No husbands, no, no sons. Ruth says, I, you know, I'll go out and I'll glean from a field. Back in those days, it was, in fact, it was according to law. You did not harvest all the way to the edge of your property. You left the edges for the poor so that they could glean food. And so Ruth decides that's what I'll go do. And then we have this verse in Ruth 2, 3. So she set out 
and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And look at these words. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. It just so happened that the day Ruth decides to go out and glean from a field, she finds herself in the field of Boaz. And if you go back and you look at the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1, you find out that Boaz is the great-grandfather of David, from whom the line would lead to Jesus. What a coincidence. No, it's the providence of God, working in the normal course of living. God rules all things to the benefit of his people and to the glory of his name. And so even when his own people, like Esther and Mordecai, make decisions that come from ambiguous motives at best or perhaps even outright disobedience, God is still providentially working through those very things to fulfill his promise, which leads to the second reason why Esther is not to be ignored, because it's all about the salvation of God. The situation in and around Susa looks like this for the Jews. No king. No army, no prophets, no land, no priesthood, no sacrifices. They are in this predicament because their sin has been just as bad as that of the pagan nations around them, which is why they, why they are exiled in the first place. And just when it looks hopeless, the evident and recognizable providence of God emerges as we read the story. Despite their sin, Despite being so far from Jerusalem, despite being conscripted, conscripted to annihilation, God's promise to Israel made at the beginning of their nation still stands. He will destroy those who want to destroy them, no matter the circumstances, no matter how hopeless it seems. So the book of Esther shows that the Jews living in the Persian Empire are still under God's covenantal care. Why? Because God has a plan. A plan that cannot and never will be thwarted by any human agency, even when prompted by spiritual forces of evil. So let me just take the last couple minutes and, and ask you to just kind of step back with me and get a broad scope of Scripture. And I want us to begin... In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, in one of the most theologically rich sentences in the entire Bible, this portion of it from Ephesians 1, verses 8 through 10. With all wisdom and understanding, he, God, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In other words, all the threads of Scripture are unified in Christ and reach their fulfillment at just the right time through Christ. This is why sometimes you hear preachers say that everything before Christ points to him and everything after Christ points back to him. Because God's wise and understanding plan and pleasure is to find fulfillment in Christ, namely the salvation of our souls. Because until Christ, there has been this question that has been unanswered. Who will rescue us? How will I be rescued from my sin? There's only one answer to that. And it leads from Genesis to Revelation. It points to Christ. But this plan in our eyes has been put in peril. And scriptures record it. We know this because God announced it in his curse to the serpent after Adam and Eve's sin, as they succumbed to the temptation to eat forbidden fruit. So with Ephesians 1, kind of in the background, everything being unified in Christ at the right time, the fulfillment of God's purpose and plan, 
These words, the curse to the serpent, who is Satan, from Genesis 3, 15. I will put enmity or conflict between you and the woman, you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He, meaning the woman's offspring, Jesus, shall bruise or crush your head, and you, serpent, or Satan, shall bruise his heel. Now, this is a pivotal verse throughout the rest of Scripture. That's why we see it so early. So from the garden forward, Satan has tried with all he knows to foil God's plan of salvation, which was to come through Christ. Satan has attacked from below, if you will, and bruised the heel of the woman's offspring. So in the land of Persia, six centuries before Christ, it looks like Satan is going to spoil the plan of God. That Salvation is going to get, get ruined because we have these words in, in Esther 3, verse 9. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, meaning the Jews. And I'll give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his finger, gave it to Haman, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews, keep the money, do with the people as you please. What's good? What do you mean? This can't, this can't happen. Why? Jesus' own words to the woman at the well. Do you remember in John 4? Salvation comes through who? The Jews. Salvation will come through the Jews, but here's Satan trying to thwart that plan. We'll just annihilate them. Centuries before Haman, Pharaoh tried this, remember? Midwives, kill the Hebrew baby boys. They wouldn't do it for conscience sake. Well, then it's just open season. Any, Hebrew, any Egyptian, kill Hebrew baby boys. Let's just do away with this race. Centuries after Haman in the book of Esther, Herod would say, kill the baby boys born in Bethlehem two years and under. We'll just, we'll thwart this. We'll get, we'll get rid of these people. It's Genesis 3, 15 being played out, bruising the heel, bruising the heel until the final crushing defeat of Satan, who is at last thrown into the burning sulfur. So let's not minimize the story of Esther. It's not a story about a woman who wins a beauty pageant. It's a story about the salvation of God. It's another example of spiritual battle where Satan is trying to bruise the heel of our Savior, but whom we know ultimately crushes him in defeat. So when we ask, where is God? we can know that he is working in all things for the good of those who love him and are called to this purpose of sharing this message of good news. So let's pray. We ask you, God, to open our eyes and our minds to beautiful truths in this story over the coming weeks, if it's your will to give them to us. Would we come to know you better? not just to answer questions about you, but to know you, to worship you, to share you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand as we end this morning with a song. If you remember, we actually wrote for the series of Daniel where we learned many of the same lessons uh, of God's sovereignty and, and provision and his plan not being thwarted. So let's sing this together.
seasons He removes and sets up king Nothing can stand against him He alone controls all things He knows what's in the darkness dwells with him though many stand against him his reign shall have no So what's your homework this week? Read Esther and make Ty happy. And hopefully we see the provision of God through that. So with that, thank you for joining us. Hope to see you around next week.